the session. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Yishan. I'm a member of the events team for Work on Climate. Um, for any of you who are not familiar with Work on Climate, we are a nonprofit and we're also the world's largest climate community. Um, one, of our, one of our main objectives is to create educational content to help demystify climate work and also make it more accessible for job seekers and founders. So today we're very excited to be able to host with Gregory, um, who is an MBA coach, um, and he will share with us on the two-hour job search. Um, so after his presentation, we will also have a Q&A um, in the last 10 to 15 minutes. So if you have any questions, um, please drop them in on the chat um, and we can uh, discuss it in the Q&A. Um, I'll pass it over to you, Greg. All right. Thanks so much, Yishan. And if everyone could mute and you can have your camera on or off, whatever is comfortable for you, as uh, Yishan said, we're going to have time for questions at the end but uh, you can also feel free to drop questions or comments into the chat. If you see me looking away from the camera, I've got chat over here on this screen to my left, camera camera, camera two over here, which isn't on. Um, I, I wanna give it just a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I've spent my entire career trying to make an impact in one way or another. I've worked in community organizing. That's where I started my career in politics. I've worked in government. I worked in open source software consulting specifically for impact oriented nonprofits. And I've worked in sustainability, both as an account manager and as a communications professional. Uh, climate change and sustainability is something <laughs> that has always been uh, an interest of mine and a, and a passion. So it's great to be here with so many people who share that interest and passion for um, moving our economy in, in a more sustainable and regenerative direction. Uh, I've chosen most recently to make my impact by helping people, many of them smarter than me, get jobs in this space. For the last seven years, I've worked with MBAs at the Foster School of Business, and in the last five years, specifically helping those students with their career searches, over 600 students to date. Uh, part of my job is to read books like the two-hour job search and distill the key lessons and share them with my students. And I'm excited to share them with all of you today. There are so many tips and points in the book, and I'm going to be more than scratching the surface, but not going all the way through it. So if this method resonates with you and you want to find more about it, I strongly encourage you to pick up the book, The Two-Hour Job Search by Steve Dalton, who is also an MBA career coach at the Fuqua School at Duke. All right, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, there are seven steps to job hunting, and we're really just going to touch on these three that are covered in the two-hour job search. Prioritizing your target employers, contacting, folks at those target employers, and recruiting advocates to provide you with internal referrals. All right, this isn't about uh, how to ace the interview. It's not how to about select a job offer. It's not about writing your resume or cover letter or any of that. Let's take a, a little bit of a closer look here. My goal is to introduce you to a, syst uh, sorry, a, a systematic process um, to help you maximize the results of your job search and minimize the effort. We're gonna talk about how you create your LAMP list, which is an acronym that I'll go into in a moment, writing a six point email, that's to reach out to contacts at a target company. The 3B7 tracking algorithm for keeping track of those contacts and the Tiara framework for conducting informational interviews. I hope the takeaway is that you've got a job search strategy tool that you can start putting to use right away. And for those who've just come in, if you could mute yourself because we are recording the session for those who can't attend live. Um, I will stop after each of those four sections or pause, I should say, to field any questions that uh, come up in the chat. 
All right. So uh, first, just to get you all warmed up, I know we had some engagement in the chat already, but if you absolutely love networking, let's see a one in the chat. And if you would like to go to the dentist more than you would like to go networking, let's get a zero in the chat. Binary solo. <laughs> A lot of zeros and ones here. Okay, we got a lot of people who don't love networking and we got some who do. Well, I have good news for both the introverts and the extroverts, those who love networking and those who don't. This is a process that makes it simpler and more effective. But let's talk a little bit about the job market first, okay? So the job postings that you see on LinkedIn, on um, Indeed, or wherever else you're looking, they're kind of like the iceberg, right? You only see the top of it. But the hidden job market is so much bigger. And the two-hour job search is about gaining access to the hidden job market. It's about helping you become the preferred candidate. And it works by expanding your network into the companies and industries where you want to find employment. It all really starts, though, with coming up with that target list of companies. So, companies. so let's jump in to part one, creating your target list. But I know what you might be thinking. I already have a list of target companies, and you could rattle them off to me in your head. You might even have them written down. But the list that we're going to talk about creating is just a little bit different. Okay, So put a plus one in the chat, or just a one, uh, to make it easier. If you have a list of target companies, you know, five to seven companies. Let's see those come through. Okay, probably a lot of you have a list of five to seven companies. So what might surprise you is what I say next is that with the lamp list that we're going to talk about, you should have 40 companies on the list. I know you might be thinking 40 companies, how do I have time to research 40 companies? Well, Got some good news. We're not going to research all the companies, but this is part of like a design thinking methodology where we want to go wide and, and really create a lot of opportunity and choices or options for ourselves before we narrow in and focus on what might be those top 10 companies. So we want to go beyond the usual suspects. Um, we want to find companies we might never have heard of before, but are doing the kinds of things that interest us. And I think this is really great in the sustainability space, especially as we see so much growth in climate tech, clean tech, clean energy, electric vehicles and mobility, uh, sustainable agriculture, um, stopping food waste, uh, decarbonization and carbon removal. There are so many companies that we may never have heard of. If we only limited ourselves to the ones we'd heard of, we would be missing out. So we are going to talk about how we create uh, this target list. And I see Stanley's got a question. Uh, does the recommendation of going after lesser known companies have to do with competition? Well, um, Yes and no. I mean, you know, I always say this with the students that I work with. Every student comes in and I say, uh, what companies are on your target list? And they say, well, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, I mean, Meta, Google, uh, Salesforce, Tableau, right? And I go, okay, how about a company that isn't on everyone else's list, right? You know, every student comes and five of 10 companies uh, you know, are represented on almost every student's list, especially when we include um, consulting firms on top of that. Uh, smaller companies, yes, there might be less competition. You might get in on the ground floor, so to speak, um, and that could increase your chances. Smaller companies also increase your chances of a role being created for you, right? That's what I mean by saying become the uh, preferred candidate before the job is even written, all right? So let's talk about what the LAMP list is and what it stands for. It stands for List, Advocacy, Motivation, and Posting, all right? This is a process that takes about 70 minutes. So this is the bulk of the two hours in the two-hour job search is coming up with this list of 40 companies. Uh, first is the list. 40 companies on the list, 40 minutes. I'm going to go through each of these steps in a moment. 
advocacy is finding someone in the company that you already know. Motivation is assessing how motivated are you to work to get the job. And postings is identifying whether that company is already hiring, has actual listings out there that apply to your skills and the kind of role that you want. Okay, uh, next I'm gonna go into each of these in more detail. So there are many ways to come up with a list. The first, the easiest one is to take the list you have. That's probably your dream employers. Like I said, it's probably five to seven, maybe 10 companies, write it down, put it on the list. Uh, the second way is alumni. So looking for people you already know and where they work. Um, this might be if you've recently graduated from school, you might look at your, uh, on LinkedIn, you might look at the alumni feature for your school and see where do people that graduated from my school work, and then pick out some companies from there that look good to you. Postings could be looking at uh, lists of companies that are already advertising for jobs. You might look at Ed's Green Job List, Climate Base, Green Job Search, Elemental Accelerator, or Breakthrough Energy Ventures job boards. There are other venture firms that have job boards as well, that sort of thing. So you're already looking like, who's hiring in this space? Let me pick some companies that look interesting. And the fourth is trend following. So maybe you look at, uh, you know, uh, top 20 companies to benefit from the Inflation Reduction Act, right? Or uh, 10 most innovative companies tackling climate change, you know, lists like that, that are maybe in Fast Company or um, Inside Climate News or some other source of, uh, you know, climate change news that you read. Grist's, Grist has lists like that. Um, as well as a canary media, I'm sure you could look at like who's getting, which companies are getting written about. The idea here is not to research the companies, it's just to get them onto your list. The next step is the advocacy step. This is where you're going, you're going to look for an internal advocate at the firm. This could be a first degree connection, someone who's in a group with you on LinkedIn, perhaps it's an alumni connection. So someone that went to your college or your graduate program or a training program that you've gone through. You could also here go a little bit beyond first degree connections and see, you know, if you've got a really strong connection in common with that person, maybe you put it into a, a yes column, right? So what you're gonna do here, and I'm gonna show an example of this spreadsheet and you can download it off the two hour job search website is uh, you're gonna have a column for each of these. So the company name, then advocacy, it's gonna be a yes or a no. If you don't have a connection there, you'll put in a no. Um, next step, we're gonna go to uh, uh, motivation. Right? This is assessing your motivation. How hard do I want to work to get the job? Not how badly do I want to work for that company? How badly do I want to work to get the job at that company? Right? It's a subtle difference there. Um, and this is the most important factor in your rating. You're going to give it a score from zero to three. One is the lowest, three to the, is the highest. And a zero is, you know what, I really don't know enough to know yet. So that's what you're going to do there. And then postings. Here we're going to circle back through and we're going to very quickly just type into LinkedIn or Indeed, for example, and look again to see, are they hiring for the kind of thing that I do? Let's say you're a, a full stack developer. Are they hiring for a full stack developer or a product manager if you're a product manager or you want to be in FP&A? So you're going to look, are they hiring for finance roles? And this is going to be, again, uh, a point scoring, as you can see on the screen there. Three is that they have a relevant posting to you. Two is the posting is semi-relevant. Uh, one is that there's you can't find any opening um, that's relevant. And zero is there's no opening or not hiring. Um, so I see a question from Charlie. Is it uh, worthwhile to use multiple like Indeed, LinkedIn, et cetera? You know, 
LinkedIn is kind of where it's at because there's, you know, 860 million people on LinkedIn or something like that. Uh, 87% of recruiters use LinkedIn and something like 67% only use LinkedIn. The caveat that I would give here is when you get into some of the smaller niches of industries and smaller companies, they might use more niche or specialized uh, 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 job boards. So it might be worth thinking about that if you go through a couple of these and you don't see anything on LinkedIn, right? You might want to look, okay, maybe I should check Indeed or maybe I should check, you know, angel.co or, um, you know, one of these green jobs boards. All right. The goal here is not to find the job that you're applying for. I want to be clear. This is to get a sense of, do they hire for the kind of thing that I do? And this is all about factoring into your prioritization of your LAMP list. So ultimately, you'll have a spreadsheet that looks something like this. You'll fill it in, and then it'll look something like this with some company names and your yes for alumni, three for, for motivation, three for posting. You're going to sort first by motivation, second by posting, and then third by, uh, it says alumni here, but it means advocate. Um, with students, sometimes we say specifically we're looking at alumni, but really it's any internal advocate. Uh, I'm sure you're all Excel wizards here, but um, this is what it looks like to do your sort of multi-column sort in Excel. And then we have our uh, sorted LAMP list. So what you're going to do from this point on, this, we're going to move into the second stage, which is making contact. But the idea is that you're going to work from top to bottom in this list, reaching out and then conducting informational interviews to build your network at these companies. I'm gonna take a, a brief pause here. If there are any burning questions about creating your LAMP list, anything that I've said so far, you can type them in the chat and we can go from there. Um, while I wait for those to come in, rather than just sit here in awkward silence, uh, let me ask again. Um, well, actually, I'm not gonna ask, I'm just gonna tell you. Uh, the 40 companies is really important. If you don't get to that size of a list, you're going to be too narrowly focused and you're gonna miss potential good options out there. The other thing to know is that in, uh, especially in more niche uh, industries, and I would still call like all these climate change related industries a niche, the networks are much more vast than you even imagine. So someone who's working at a small climate tech startup maybe worked at a bigger climate tech startup. Maybe they worked at Tesla before, right? So um, you want to sort of go wide for that reason. Let's see. I saw a couple uh, questions come in here. Um, uh, what's the best way to optimize finding smaller companies in climate? I've had a rough time of this myself. Uh, well, I would say for that, look at the venture capital firms and look at their portfolios. So Elemental Accelerator has over 120 uh, portfolio companies. They have a job board with 900 open positions right now. Um, you know, another one would be Breakthrough Energy Ventures. Uh, there's uh, Climate VC, I think has a job board as well. Uh, uh, Shadow Ventures, which used to be, I think Urban X is another one to take a look at. Um, Let's see, if you're looking for remote roles, is it worth doing informational interviews at dream employers who are not hiring remote workers? Um, so Anisha, again, I would say the network might be valuable, but if you know, you're in London and they're in San Francisco and they don't allow remote work, well, you're probably better off focusing on UK-based companies that don't allow remote work because they might more be more open to you like coming into the office once a month or you know a week a quarter or something like that um oops i jumped ahead there let's see okay i'm gonna move on in the interest of time here so the next step is making contact and I know you're probably thinking, I send emails all day long. Uh, I work the DMs on Twitter. You know, I know how to do this. 
but you know, for a lot of people that cold outreach to someone, even if it's someone that they know or knew once can be a little bit daunting. Um, and even if you write emails all the time, I'm going to share with you some tips for writing a very particular type of email for making contact. But let's talk about the point of making contact. In the two-hour job search, the point of these contacts is to distinguish between three different types of people that you're likely to encounter. And Steve Dalton calls them curmudgeons, obligates, and boosters. Your uh, objective here is to find the boosters. We want to find those boosters because those are the people who are going to go to bat for you. Obligates will help you out of some feeling of obligation. Oh, they were part of my fraternity. You know, I guess I'll help them out. Or Joe said that they're a good guy. I guess I'll help them out. But we want to find the boosters, the people who are really going to go to bat for you. Curmudgeons, they will just waste your time. So if you find a curmudgeon, you want to cut bait and then go after the boosters. All right, so how do we figure out who those people are? It all starts with a six point email. Um, the six point email isn't that the email has six points in it. There are six points to crafting the email. The first is that it's fewer than 75 words. And you're probably thinking, whoa, how can I reach out to someone and write less than a hundred words? I mean, I was thinking 300 words, like the whole page, right? Okay, I'm gonna show you how you do it in a moment. Um, the second is that you ask for insights in advance and you're not asking for job leads. The third point is that you want to state your connection first. There's a great uh, example of this. Uh, any, any fans of the Princess Bride out there, right? You know what I'm saying? My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. He states his name and connection. You killed my father, right? And expectations, prepare to die, right? State your request. This is point four. State your request in the form of an actual question. If you want to meet with someone on Zoom or in person, you have to actually ask. And the fifth point is define your interests both narrowly, let's say about that company or about the, uh, the, that particular role and more broadly the industry uh, could be an example there. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on these. Um, and then the sixth point is that more than half of the email should be about the contact and not about you. This is not a cover letter. You know, the, the, uh, um, the booster will not care actually anything about you other than what your connection is, right? They will take the meeting because of the connection. A curmudgeon will want to know, oh, well, why do you want to talk to me and, you know, send me your resume first so I can look it over, you know, they'll put up all kinds of roadblocks. So there's nothing that you can say in a message, in this message about yourself that will help you identify the booster. In fact, the less you say about you, the more likely you are to identify the booster. So let's um, go into this a little bit more detail here. Point number one, fewer than 75 words. Why? It's quick to read. It fits on one smartphone screen, right? There's no scrolling. The person doesn't have to be like, oh, this is too long. I don't have time to read it. I'll come back to it later, right? It's boom, quick and to the point. The second point, you wanna ask for insights and advice. Not everyone's hiring, but everyone has insights and advice. The third point is to state your connection first. What's your connection? I see you're part of the work on climate community. Um, hey, maybe you're looking for something internal, right? So you're at Microsoft, you wanna get onto the climate and energy team at Microsoft, you reach out. Hey, I've been at Microsoft for five years. I'd really like to move into the climate and energy team. I see you made a similar move three years ago. I'd love to get your insights, right? So that could be your current employer. Um, undergrad or graduate school, I think is obvious. LinkedIn group, hey, we're both part of the product managers LinkedIn group. Um, you know, I'd love to talk to you about your role as a product manager in a clean tech company, so forth. And then we've got this other category. I'm gonna go into that in a moment. So you state that connection. And if you don't have the connection, there is another option. It's called fan mail, right? So fan mail could be like, I saw that you recently spoke at a conference on climate change, I found your presentation really 
informative. I'd love to talk to you about how you got into this career, right? That would be a fan mail option. Maybe they wrote an article. Maybe they did a webinar like this, right? Maybe they were on a podcast that you listened to. You state that. I heard you on Gregory Heller's Conversations on Careers and Professional Life podcast. Um, your pivot sounded awesome. I'd love to talk to you a little bit more because I'm trying to make a similar pivot. All right. The fourth, state your request in the form of a question. Um, don't beat around the bush. Would you be available to meet for 15 to 30 minutes sometime in the next week or two? Okay, we're giving them an option here, right? Um, 15 or 30 minutes. So they can say that we're not saying an hour. Asking for an hour is way too much. Um, in the next week or two, it's defined. So they know they've got to get back to you, right? And there's another piece of this in, in the letter, uh, which you can sometimes add, which is to say at the end, I recognize it might be a busy time for you. If I don't hear back, I'll circle back around in a week. And that way they know they cannot dodge your email because you're going to come back around again. Okay, the fifth point, define your interests both narrowly and broadly. Look at that, I didn't have my animations right. Um, narrow is the like a specific role at the target company. I'd love to hear what it's like to be a product manager at Modern Electron or more broadly industry a role. I'd love to hear what it's like to be a product manager in clean tech, right? Or I'd love to learn more about clean tech in Seattle because I'm moving to Seattle and you work in that industry, right? So narrowly and broadly. That's what I mean by that, or that's what Steve Dalton means by it, but by extension, it's what I mean by it. Um, the sixth point, the final point, half of the words are about the contact. Focus on the contact, not you. Because again, the booster doesn't care about what you've done, what your current job is, what kind of impact you've had already, right? The booster, all they need to know is your connection. Oh. Joe said I should talk to you? Sure, I got 15 minutes next Tuesday between 11 and three. Tell me which time works best for you. Done, scheduled, over. So let's look at an example of a six point email. Here we go. Um, hey Stacy, I'm a member of the Work on Climate Slack community. Could I talk with you about your product management experience at AWS for 15 or 20 minutes in the coming week or two? I'm trying to learn more about product management at cloud computing companies in Seattle. So your insights would be greatly appreciated, right? Boom, boom, boom. How many words? 59 words, okay? Totally economical in terms of words. This is where we have, we're stating the connection. We're both part of the work on climate community, for example. Um, the connection could be anything else that I, examples that I gave. Let's look at the fan mail example, okay? This is a fan mail example. Hey, Stacy, I heard your interview on conversations on careers and professional life. It's a fantastic podcast, by the way. And I found your experience making a career pivot into sustainability really encouraging. I'm also trying to pivot into product management at clean tech companies in Seattle. Would you have 15 or 30 minutes to talk about your experience making a similar pivot? Thanks, Gregory. Okay. It's still 59 words, if I counted right, but it's close. It's definitely less than 75 words and it fits on one screen, right? Um, I see so many people get hung up on being way too verbose. So what I always tell them or complicated sentences, unclear writing and so forth. Uh, they're great tools now. Hemingway app or Grammarly, both are fantastic. Um, shows you the grade level. You should be targeting for less than 10th, essentially. The number of words, we've got 59 here. You don't want passive voice. This sentence, look, it actually turned out to be really uh, complex. And I've got this adverb really encouraging. Maybe that flagged something for me. I don't want to make it shorter. So here I um, actually straightened it out by making it uh, two sentences makes it a little bit clearer, a little bit easier to read. All right, so uh, I've, I've come to the end of the six point email section of the presentation. I'll pause here to see if there are any questions. I see that there's been some 
uh, back and forth in the chat, which is great. I haven't been able to uh, keep an eye on all of that while presenting. Um, but if there are any questions, uh, you know, pop those in a chat and I'll take those now. Um, There's a question I'll... from Daniel. Um, um, he's asking if your connection at the target company doesn't work in the role you're looking for, what do you ask? Okay. So um, there's uh, so let, let's say your connection, yeah, it's not in the role or, or anything, but it's a good friend. Let's say you have a good friend at Microsoft. They're not on the clean energy team or global uh, data center team or whatever that you want to be on. So you could ask them, hey, do you know anyone who works on the global energy team? Or I see that you're connected to Nur Berhart, who directs the energy team for the EMEA region. Um, would you feel comfortable uh, introducing me to him? Here is a message you could send. Okay, again, and we do this all the time with my students. This is a great question. If you have a contact that's an intermediary and they are a close enough contact, what you can do is ask them to make that introduction. But you don't want to say, uh, hey, Yishan, can you introduce me to Nur Berhard on the global energy team? Then Yishan has to get back to me and say, uh, well, why do you want to be introduced to him? Oh, well, I think his job looks really cool. Uh, well, could you tell me what I should say to him about why you want to be introduced to him? No, you just write the description. So it's like, hey, Nur, my friend Gregory would really love to talk to you about how you made the transition into working on the global energy team at Microsoft. He's looking to get into clean energy. Um, and thought that your experience might be illustrative. May I introduce you? So you are writing that on behalf of your common connection so that your common connection gets the email and all they have to say is, sure, done. Or I don't know Nur well enough to make the introduction, right? You wanna lower friction, you wanna lower the back and forth as much as possible. Any other questions come in? Um, Alita asking, the Hemingway app seems awesome. Uh, one, one, what was the other app? Um, that um, Grammarly. Grammarly is the other one that can be used. And you know what? Uh, Microsoft Snow Slouch, like they have really gotten good, um, you know, at, at improving word and words grammar checking and suggestion stuff in, in Microsoft Word and in Outlook. Um, Google, I think you can actually get a Grammarly plugin for Google. The point is you want to relentlessly edit and make sure that your messages are as short and as clear as possible. Because the goal here, it's not to sell yourself. Like that's not the objective. The objective of this message is to find the booster who is going to respond to you. And this is, we're going to get to this in the next section, which is tracking the contacts in three business days or less. That's going to be your booster, right? The person who doesn't respond right away, they're probably an obligate. They might just be busy, but they're probably an obligate because they're like, Ugh. the the booster reads their everybody. You come in, you you scan your email, you triage as it comes in. If it's a quick email that requires a quick response, you just take care of it. So that's how you're going to find your booster. All right. So and oh, I should say yeah. Someone um, I just see said. Uh, like a personalized LinkedIn invite. Um, you can also do that. If you're reaching out to someone who you not, are not already connected with on LinkedIn or do not already have their email address, you can uh, send a connect message to them on LinkedIn with this six point email structure. The issue there is that not everyone lives on LinkedIn. I mean, I live on LinkedIn, but not everyone does. So if you don't get a return message, you know, within three days or within seven days, I wouldn't even assume that it's because this person doesn't want to respond to you. They might not have their notifications turned on. They might not live on LinkedIn. However, if they're posting on LinkedIn every day and they haven't responded to you, then you found an obligate or a curmudgeon. There's another little trick uh, that I learned this from the LinkedIn guys, Jeremy Schiefling, who I also interviewed on my podcast. He wrote the book Linked which is a fantastic companion to the two-hour job search. 
about um, basically it's like the missing manual for using LinkedIn for your job search. Uh, there's a sign that says, and this tip has nothing to do with LinkedIn. There's a website called hunter.io. And basically it can help you find people's email addresses at big companies, uh, at a lot of companies based upon what's known about the uh, name email formatting, right? So like my email is gheller at uw.edu. It could be like, hey, like everybody is first initial last name at this company. So if you're looking to find Gregory Heller, try G Heller at, you know, companyx.com. So that's hunter, hunter.io. I don't know if someone wants to just drop that into the chat for folks. Um, do people find it creepy? You don't have to say how you found their email address, right? You know, I get emails all the time uh, from folks who, I don't know where they found my email address. Some of those are commercial solicitations. This is not a commercial solicitation that you're sending. You're elevating this person as an expert in their field. So it should feel good, right? Someone's reaching out. I'd love to get your insights into your industry. Oh, they might ask, how'd you hear about me? And be like, well, I saw your, you know, an article you wrote and I Googled your name and I found your email address. That's all you have to say, something like that. I tracked down your email address through your company's website or something. Okay, so let's talk about 3B7. What is it? This is another place where people just really fall down on their outreach is tracking when you've reached out to someone, when you should follow up. You know, the number of times I've had a student say to me, well, I reached out to three people I know at company X. No one's gotten back to me. It's been two weeks. What should I do? I'm like, well, you just wasted a week and a half waiting for people to respond to you. So this is where 3B7 comes in. When you send out a message, you set a reminder for yourself in three business days and seven business days. You can put this in your Google calendar, in your Outlook calendar, you can use Tasks app, whatever it is that you use. Um, uh, you know, just set the reminder for yourself, right? So like, you know, follow up with G Heller, follow up with G Heller, right? Three business days, seven business days. If you haven't heard back, from your first contact at a company in three business days, find another contact at that target company to reach out to. And then seven days after not hearing back from the first person, you send them another note or you just hit reply all to the original one and you say, hey, I realize you know this might've gotten buried in your inbox, would love to connect. Um, and that really has to be it. And then if they don't respond, you know it's a curmudgeon and you cut them loose, okay? I have a flow chart for this, but I always have to describe it first because the flow chart um, can be a little bit tricky as well. There's a lot going on here. I've tried to simplify it as much as possible. So here, you're gonna start here. You're gonna send out your new contact and set up your three B and seven B reminders. If the contact responds within three business days, yes. Are they, did they say they're willing to speak with you? Yes. Do an informational interview and send a thank you note 24 hours later. All right. If they are not willing to speak with you, go back to the beginning again and send out another message. If they say, uh, I'm really busy for the next six months, uh, why don't you try, try me in the new year, right? Okay, curmudgeon and move on. Um, if they don't respond in three business days, then you're going to um, go back to the beginning, send out another contact to the next person that you might be connected to or have some connection with. Um, and then seven days later, follow up with them with another email. Uh, if they respond within three business days of the second email, then are they willing to speak with you? Yes, do an informational, no, go back to the beginning again. Um, and if they say, if they do not respond to you, after the second email that came seven business days later, you're going to abandon that contact completely. Uh, clearly they're a curmudgeon, they don't check their email, they don't check their LinkedIn, they're not willing to help you out. All right, I know that's a little, blue, 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 blue. <laughs> goes around a bunch of times, but the bottom line here is you never wanna be dead in the water, waiting, just waiting, waiting, waiting on a contact, because the goal here is to find the boosters and the boosters will reply to you quickly. The curmudgeons will not, 
the obligates right. will drag their feet. If everybody could mute while we're on this, just for the posterity of the recording, all right? Is this all the same contact or was there something about finding a different contact at the company? Yeah, so if after three days, your initial contact, for example, you reach out to me, you wanna know what it's like to work at a business school, right? And three days later, I haven't replied. You're gonna find someone else that works at the Foster School of Business or at another business school if you're sort of just thinking business schools in Seattle and not Foster specifically and you're gonna reach out to a new person after three business days. The other mistake that I see people make is that they send out five emails to people at one company. And then uh, three people respond to them and say, sure, I'd be happy to meet next week. And they've already scheduled with the first person and the second person and the third person. And then those three people are all like on a team call and they're like, hey, uh, I'm meeting with this guy who sounds really interesting. Um, you know, he wanted to know what it's like to work in product management at a clean tech startup. And the other person next to them is like, I'm meeting with a guy that wants to do that too. What's his name? And then the third person is like, is it Gregory Heller? And then they're like, oh, this guy emailed all of us at the same time. That's why we don't email all of our contacts at a company at one time. Start with one person, then three days later, if you haven't heard anything, go to the next person. Seven days later, circle back to the first person, right? So forth and so on until you get a good contact. I know I see some questions here. Is it, is it, can I get a plus one if the 3B7 process is clear? This is the most complicated part of the whole two hour job search thing. Okay. It's coming through loud and clear for a lot of people. Um, uh, I presume we'll make the deck available and there will be a recording as well. Uh, I'll also take a moment right now to say that there's a great LinkedIn group for the two hour job search. And if you have any questions about how to do it, um, you're running into a problem, you can ask there. And oftentimes Steve Dalton himself will answer. So that's the two hour job search group on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, yeah. And I'm coming in, coming in for a hot landing here with uh, how to prepare for the conversation and the tiara framework. So there's two types of preparation that you want to do before you have one of these coffee chats or informational interviews, or sometimes in designing your life speak, we call them um, prototyping interviews. Uh, the first is internal research and the second is external. So the internal research is um, thinking about how you'd answer these questions. Tell me about yourself, because they are certainly going to ask, <laughs> why are you interested in my organization, right? So uh, specifically about that company, why are you interested in my role or product management? Like, why do you want to talk to me? Um, or why do you want to work in this sector and industry? So this is internal preparation. It's how you would answer these questions because they will probably come up at the beginning of your conversation with your contact. What type of vendor is it? Um, there is a great tool that I like to share called Udly, which can help you if you're uncomfortable uh, you know, public speaking or even just answering questions on the spot. It's a great way to practice your speaking. It's free, uh, udly.ai. It's a startup here in Seattle and they were just awarded uh, or um, raised $6 million to keep building and improve the product. So I like it a lot. Uh, it can help you get real smooth with those answers. The second type of research is the external research. You know, this, you don't have to spend, you know, five hours researching every company and every person, but you want to at a minimum do these things. See what headlines the company is promoting, either via LinkedIn or their media and news page on their website, or if they have a blog, you want to Google the company and the individual. Um, you want to uh, check LinkedIn for the company and the individual right? To see like, what is the company posting and what is the person you're going to meet with posting? And then you might want to go the extra step of looking at the investor relations page, reading the 10K or listening to an earnings call so that you can get a better sense of what's going on with that company. 
Okay. I would say that third bullet point or sorry, fourth bullet point there is going um, the extra mile above and beyond. And especially if you're looking for like a finance role, I would totally do that. If you're looking for a product management role, maybe not so much. And again, that might only be applicable for publicly traded companies. In the informational interview, um, you're probably going to start with some small talk and then move on to the Q&A uh, and finally identifying some next steps. Small talk is something that some people have some challenges with, uh, but I always say, remember that interested is interesting. And what that means is if you ask questions and if you appear interested in what the other person is talking about, you will appear to be interesting to them. So uh, my, I'm gonna just want, I could do a whole hour on small talk probably. Here's my one tip. On Monday and Tuesday, you can ask, how was your weekend? Did you do anything fun? On Thursday and Friday, you can ask, you got any good plans for the weekend? Um, it may sound cliched, but talking about the weather, especially if you're local to the person like here in Seattle, oh my God, have you been enjoying this amazing summer weather? Person's going to say, yeah, I was out paddle boarding on Bainbridge the other day. It was fantastic, you know, yada, yada. And that just warms them up. Well, so what do you say on Wednesday if the meeting's Wednesday? Don't schedule meetings for Wednesday. No, just kidding. On Wednesday, you can be like, how's your week going, right? Um, a simple question like that can get people talking. But then you're going to want to move into uh, the real questions. And the one overarching thing is you really shouldn't be asking any questions for which you could Google the answer. You know, you don't want to ask, oh, what's the culture like at your company? You know, or like, uh, how much company has you, how much money has your company raised? You know, all that stuff's publicly available. Just Google for it. Um, in the two hour job search, the framework that gets laid out is called the Tiara framework, which stands for trends, insights, advice, resources, and assignments. And just like I've done in the last uh, three sections, I'll do it in this section. I'm going to go into each one in a little bit more detail. So trend questions. Example, what trends are most impacting your business right now? Right? Oh, well, we're really excited about the Inflation Reduction Act and the money in there for carbon removal. Oh, tell me more, right? Um, insights questions. Uh, oops, hit the wrong button there. Insights questions. Um, what surprises you most or what surprised you most about your company and your job if someone has just moved into the company, right? Or, you know, you've been in uh, clean tech, it looks like for like eight years. Uh, what insights do you have about where the industry is going? Okay. Um, there's a reason for the order of these questions. These first two questions about trends and insights. Well, for starters, there's no wrong answer to them because you're asking for an opinion. And it puts the person you're talking to on this like pedestal of expertise. Okay. We move from that to advice. If you were me, what's the one thing you do right now to best prepare for a career in this field? Oh, I'd go and get this certification. Oh, you got to go to this conference. Oh, read this book. You know, get, go get an MBA, <laughs> whatever it is. Um, this is the advice question, right? And the advice question is just a little bit different from the resources question, right? What resources would you recommend I look into next? So this could be, again, books, podcasts, like conversations on careers and professional life. <laughs> my podcast. Maybe it's a different one, but my climate journey, you got to listen to my climate journey, or you got to listen to reversing climate change from Nori. Um, right. So this is uh, resources. Definitely go to the Verge conference or whatever it is. Right. And then the last type of question is the assignments question. Assignments isn't, you're not asking them to assign you something. You are asking them to talk about something that they are working on, right? Which project of yours do you feel has had the greatest impact, right? It gets them talking about themselves, the impact they've had, leaves them with a warm, rosy feeling as we round out the 25 minute mark of the conversation with them. And then you go to next steps. This is a really important part 
It comes from Robert Cialdini's 1984 book, Influence, The Psychology of Persuasion, and it's called Commitment and Consistency. Um, you wanna ask them, if I have any additional questions, is it okay if I reach back out to you? Because then they're going to say yes. I mean, 19 out of 20 people are gonna say yes, it's fine. And when you do reach back out to them, they're gonna to wanna to be consistent with the commitment they've made and they will respond to your email, right? So you're, this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna end with a question like that. Um, and you're gonna thank them profusely for their time. Uh, and you're gonna follow up with a thank you email within 24 hours. If they've given you any uh, recommendations and you follow up on those recommendations, like listening to a podcast or reading a book, uh, or checking out a website or going to a conference, you're going to follow up and say, oh, you know, this might be a week, two weeks, a month, three months later, you know, I finished reading that book you recommended. It was really, really insightful. Thank you so much for suggesting it, right? That those email contact touch points are going to help you build a longer relationship with the person um, rather than it just being like the one and done, we had the conversation, thank you very much and move on. All right. So what are your next steps? You're going to work on your lamp list. You're going to identify contacts at your top five target companies, and you're going to start crafting and sending six point email messages and having these informational interviews. You can listen to my conversation with Steve Dalton on conversations on careers and professional life. Um, which you can find right there, conversationsoncareers.com slash 2HJS. And what I, I should say one thing that I didn't say earlier, and then we've got seven minutes for questions. Um, you are probably not going to get to company 26 on your list because by the time you get to the 12th or 15th company on your list, people are gonna start calling you and saying, hey, there's a job that just opened up that I think you'd be really good for. Um, let me send it to you. We haven't even listed it yet, right? So, uh, you know, it's not about getting all the way to the bottom of your list. And as you really consider some of these companies, you might realize that, well, in terms of motivation, they're a one. You don't want to think about them. Like you're not going to work hard. So part of it is getting some of those almost like straw men on the list so that you can compare in your mind, well, do I want to work for that company? Or wow, I'd really rather work for this company over here. All right. Um, thank you so much for your attention uh, this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are, it's a different time. Uh, as I said, really happy to have the opportunity to share about the two-hour job search with this community and really hope that it helps many of you, uh, you know, move to the next step on your job search. And I'll take any questions right now. Um, Yashan, I don't know if we want to open that up to people raising their hand and asking aloud. That's fine with me. Um, you know, I love to see people's faces uh, or we can take it in chat either way. Yeah, thank you so much, Gregory. That was an amazing presentation. I think we're getting a lot of positive feedback within our chat as well. Um, and yeah, I'm open to um, people unmuting themselves and asking questions, um, or you can also ask questions in the chat and we can read them out loud too. Um, so um, I saw a question before um, about what is the appropriate time to follow back after you've met? Um, so uh, first off, thank you note within 24 hours, right? So just a quick note, thanks so much for your time. I'm still thinking about everything you shared with me. It's rock my world, right? That kind of a thing. Um, I would say, you know, within a month, if they gave you a recommendation, listen to this podcast, read this article, check out this book, within a month, you should follow up right? If they didn't give you any recommendations or like everything they said, you're like, oh yeah, I read that already. Oh yeah, I listened to that podcast already, you know. Um, then maybe, you know, if you find an article that touches upon something that they talked about, you know, you could say, oh, hey, I saw this article and I totally thought about our conversation. You know, you probably saw it already, but in case you didn't, here it is, right? Yeah. That's always a great, I'm, I'm, that's like my, my trademark. I do that all the time with, all kinds of people because I'm reading newsletters, articles, websites, and I'm always just being like, oh, hey, check this out. Oh, look, this reminded me of you. Yeah, kind plus, of one, plus one to that. I think that also builds trust. 
um, because they also feel heard um, that yeah. you're actually listening to their advice and their tips. And it's really helpful for longer term relationship building. Yeah, it looks like Alita has her hand out there for a question. Yeah, um, I was just wondering about asking brand new contacts for introductions. Is that something that you would ask for in the initial meeting or how, how would you navigate that? Yeah, so let's say you're talking to someone and it becomes clear that they're really not the right person for you, you know, because of your skills, your particular interest, maybe it's a really big company and there's a different division that seems more relevant. You could say, you know, is there anyone else you think I should talk to at your company? Just that's it. Oh yeah, you should talk to, because remember boosters will do whatever it takes to help you. A curmudgeon will be like, mm, I'm going to have to think about that. An obligate will be like, um, yeah, give me, give me a couple days. I'll see if I can think of anyone over in that other part of the company. The booster though will be like, yeah, oh, I know this person you should talk to. Let me see if they're open to the introduction. They will almost offer it before you even ask. Yep. Um, awesome. thank, thank, you. A, thank you for the question. We have a question from Elliot. Oh, or did you want to- I just saw one in chat. I'm going to address it real quick. Okay. So if you've asked, if you've reached out to a second person and the first person gets back to you, let's say on day six, before you send them a second email, right? And you've already scheduled something with someone else at the company. Um, I think you would say, oh, you know, oh, thanks so much for getting back to me. When I didn't hear from you, I reached out to Sam and uh, I already have an appointment scheduled with him. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll follow up with you if, if Sam thinks that there's anything else that you could add. But again, they're probably an obligate if they took six days to get back to you. I think it also depends on like how close the person A and B are. If they're within the same team, yeah, um, you can tell them. Uh, yeah. yeah, if they're different. Right, yeah, if it's like Microsoft and you, you're you talking to someone at like Azure Cloud versus someone at you know uh, uh, Microsoft Earth, or someone at the global energy team, right, is huge. You might just want to take the, you know, take the, the second and third meetings with mm -hmm. other people. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Elliot. Um, she's asking, how long does it typically take to go from starting the job search to getting a real job interview? <laughs> well, I'll say that for most of the students that I work with, right, they're in a very prescribed timeline because they are, you know, MBA recruiting is a pipeline. So uh, full, like a full-time student starts their internship search in September and they have an offer by, you know, March because the interviewing all happens in January, February, and March for the most part. Full-time recruiting is different. You know, I think it really depends upon um, the industry and the companies, but, you know, it should be reasonable that if you've got a good target list and a um, reasonable, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, Self-awareness about your skills and your qualifications for a certain type of role, that you should be able to get some in interviews within three to six months of starting this process. And those would be interviews, not because like you apply, you just did a re blind resume drop on LinkedIn, but because someone said, oh, there's actually an opening on my team, right? If you think about larger companies or even small companies that are growing, they're at, they might be doubling every year in size. So um, you, you might look for, again, for startups, you might keep an eye on uh, funding news and, you know, like, Udly gets, and not that it's a climate company, but let's say Drone Seed, you know, gets another $10 million in funding. You drop a note back to the person you talk to and say, congratulations, I saw you got $10 million in funding. That's awesome. You know, and that's it. And then you're like top of mind when they're like, oh, we're adding five people to my team with that $10 million. Let me call that guy. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much, Gregory, for actually yeah. answering all of those questions. Um, this was a very insightful presentation. Yeah. So I'll just say two things. I'm going to plug the two-hour job search, the book, which you can just Google two-hour job search, twohourjobsearch.com. My podcast, Conversations on Careers and Professional Life. If you go to slash impact, you can hear about five interviews with people who have 
uh, something to say about impact-oriented careers, you can follow me or find me on uh, LinkedIn. It's just Gregory Heller. Um, and on Twitter, at Gregory Heller. Thanks so much for to work on climate, for the opportunity to share this with you all, and for those of you who are able to make it live, and for those of you who are watching the recording, sorry to, we didn't see you live, but I hope you find this helpful. Thank you, and we'll be uploading our recording to our YouTube channel, and also be sure to check out our workonclimate.org website uh, to join our um, Slack community if you're not already there. All right. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. and goodbye. Bye.